Hello everybody, welcome to another Sponge Chat. My name is Jim and I am the author of Sponge OT. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Today is the last, well this Sponge Chat is the last Sponge Chat for this academic year. I'll be taking a break for the rest of August. Um, I have a very special guest, Ben Bowman. Uh, he is the uh, Head of Teacher Education uh, for Trinity College of London. Um, he is very, very, very well known uh, throughout the world uh, and uh, he's very knowledgeable for, for teacher training, of course. Um, in this one chat, we looked at his, well, we started from his motivations uh, for moving to teacher training, some of the challenges he's faced. And then, of course, we looked at how he's progressed to where he is. Um, some of his thoughts on the future for language teacher education, which I, which I found really, really interesting. Um, and we looked at things such as, you know, plurilingualism uh, within teacher education and uh, some new qualifications. Uh, we also looked at the significance of qualifications in teacher development uh, and the significance of reflection. Uh, we, ben was, was kind enough to give us plenty of book recommendations and, and links, so I'm going to put links to all of them uh, in the blog post as well. Um, if you do like this sponge chat, please give us a like, please subscribe uh, and feel free to comment with, with your questions, queries, doubts, um, praises. We'd, we'd love to hear everything, okay? Um, so I'm going to stop speaking. Uh, have a lovely summer. Enjoy the sponge chat and we'll see you all soon, okay? Bye. Hi, Ben. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thank you, Jim. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here uh, for our last sponge chat for this academic year. Uh, I know you're a very busy man. So, so again, thank you very much for, for taking this time out of your schedule to be here. Um, thank you for, for having me. It's uh, mm. nice to chat again. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, before we get into it, perhaps we'll look at the reasons of, of, of sponge chats or the purpose. Um, and I mean, as you know, or many, many people do know, uh, but for those that are new to Spanish chats, it sort of started with, you know, an email where a teacher asked me, well, how did you move into teacher training? And uh, I realized that, you know, the way that people move into certain positions within, within EOCB at teacher training, materials development, academic management, it's all kind of, it's very different for, for every person. Um, and so the idea is to, to provide teachers, uh, well, EOT professionals in general, um, some insights on how they might uh, move into certain positions within their context. Um, and and so, so rather than teachers, you know, reaching a wall where they, they feel they can't go any further, hopefully we could provide, you know, some options for where they could go. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. Hopefully, I mean, we're, we're, we've had quite a good response from people around the world so far. So, so hopefully we, you know, this chat is going to be uh, quite good as well. Um, so maybe we can take a focus on Ben. Who is Ben? I know it's a very deep question, uh, but, but if we can talk it maybe, uh, you know, professionally, I mean, even a little bit personally, but who is Ben? Uh, well, it's a, a good question. Um, I sometimes ask that question myself uh, <laughs> when I'm kind of uh, up to my head in emails and responses and so on. Um, uh, and sometimes when people say, well, what's, when friends ask me, what's your job? Um, and I never quite know how to respond I, because I, I did say when I'm a teacher trainer or a teacher educator or something like this, um, and it, it got quite complicated. So I tend to just go, I'm a kind of teacher. Um, and so who has been, I, simply all I am, I'm a kind of teacher who happens to be in a role uh, where there's some kind of organizational uh, facilitating of teacher education amongst my peers. Um, and I very much me just, being in a role, supporting peers, helping them do their job. So I suppose the first thing and I should, I should also say I'm not just a teacher, it's that word just, it's I'm, I'm a teacher. Yeah. Um, but uh, I suppose um, aside from that, my formal title is Head of Teacher Education at Trinity College London. And as such, I'm responsible for the planning and strategic oversight of Trinity's uh, teacher education provision, not just English language, but music and drama and arts and so on as well. Right. Um, so that that kind of came out of just my general experience in teaching and teacher education, uh, which stemmed from uh, being an English language teacher. Right. So um, 
that's my kind of professional side of things. And um, I imagine we can talk a bit more about my history of that progression yeah. in a bit. Um, but aside from that, I, I live in London. I, I have a cat. Um, it, it, I have, uh, you know, I've been working from home this last uh, 18 months. Um, and I've got some wonderful colleagues um, who I can uh, liaise with, chat with, go out for meals and drinks with, etc. So just like anyone Brilliant. else. Yeah, yeah, no, excellent. Um, I mean, you, it definitely seems like we've, uh, it's, it is difficult. I mean, even you know, as a, when you try to tell people that you're a teacher or you're a teacher trainer, you know, it's, it, just saying that it doesn't really sort of um, capture the essence of what you do sometimes. I mean, and obviously your role is quite, you know, it's quite large and quite, quite important. And, you know, with so many sort of fingers in different areas, um so yeah it, it seems it must be i'm a kind of teacher yeah <laughs> uh, it's interesting um well maybe we can focus on on the history obviously you you started in in english language teaching and um from from memory i i think you you, you went to japan and then um and then you then you got qualified and and, and you did the, the sort of the teaching thing um but i suppose from that, what was your motivation to move from teaching uh, into teacher training? I mean, what, what was sort of the catalyst? And it was like, okay, that, that's what I want to do. Was it something that you'd intended to do? Or was it something that you just fell into? Or um, it, It's something I think that I partly, I think I intended to do it once I saw other people doing it. Um, so I, as you said, I started in, um, after my degree, I went to Japan. I worked as an assistant English language teacher there. Um, I thought to myself, I've done this teaching thing now. I'll go and do another job. I did another job, realized I hated it and I preferred teaching and ended my cert TESOL. Um, so that, that's why I kind of went back and start, went back, went back into teaching properly. Right. Um, but it wasn't until I think I went to my diploma level qualification that I, I saw the people around me um, talking about teaching and teacher education in a way that really kind of stimulated my interest I found really really interesting and they knew so much more about what I was doing than I did right. um, and they had a lot of the answers that I needed to make myself better as a teacher I think I always wanted to be better as a teacher uh, and that's been kind of the the root of all of my kind of development and change uh, and so it's like by let's say, first of all, becoming, when I did my diploma, and then when I became a self trainer, I noticed then that I had a lot of those answers that I needed when I wasn't a self trainer. Uh, and th then I found teachers coming to me asking me those questions, and I was able to ha help them be better at their teaching. So not only was I better at my own job, I was then able to help others be better. And really that then continued as I became a more experienced, I became like a self trainer, then like a course, like a, a um, main course tutor. And then I became a Delta trainer um, or an examiner, then a lead examiner. Um, and at each of the different levels that I was working, every extra step I took, every different kind of uh, type of qualification I got involved with, it broadened my knowledge and, and, and kind of gave me greater depth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And all of that just helped me become a better teacher I think and helped me draw together the strands of my students learning but also the teacher trainees learning other teachers learning and it made me able to help them make connections to help them be better at what they were doing so I suppose at the heart of it all has been this idea that just trying to be better at my job be understand what I'm doing and also why I'm doing it yeah. and then being able to freely share that information with others to help them be better at their teaching as well that yeah, brilliant um yeah I, I i can sort of see that in myself as well you know you when i did my delta you know you, you're working with people that are very very experienced and you're like okay this guy he knows his stuff you know i, I was working with the iti crew and i was working with sally hurst and and, and the team there and you know they're just they're, they're just they're just able to you know impart or to help you see things very very effectively and I was like okay I want I want to I wanted to do that so very similar thing and then I, I, I pushed I found a way to do it um when your first sort of teacher training I, I don't want to say gig but your first teacher training uh role if as it were was it in was it in the sort of the local context in, in the in the institution where you were working or was it straight away to to to, to moving into SELTA training um, so it was, it was, there was in-house training first. Um, right. So I think 
one of the what, because when when you want to um, become a teacher educator on a um a validated provisional accredited course like a cert TESOL or a CELTA um you need to have the approval of that awarding organization to become a, a trainer for that particular qualification so this this is before i got my uh my delta um i wanted to start getting involved um so the person who was heading up the CELTA at the organization where i worked they were interested in they saw my kind of interest in it and they they kind of got me involved in supervised lesson planning which they could do so i got a little just like a little bit involved there learning about the the CELTA course itself uh, but i was also heavily involved in running the in-house training courses for uh the school um so every wednesday lunchtime there'd be like a 20 minute here's some top tips or here's this thing that's, that someone's learned about or whatever um so i found myself running those and that gave me some really nice experience in just working with in service teachers yeah. um and just kind of getting my feet wet if you will mm. now of course free service and in service are two very different things yeah. um but um that kind of experience of doing that helped the school management see that i was interested in that and also when it came to my application to become a self trainer um then um well, i was able to draw on that experience and i could see that i wasn't just someone um very fresh from teaching but yeah. i did have a, a breadth of experience not just in um in that particular yeah. school but in other schools um and across different subject areas and in uh, different focuses within english but that included um teacher support and development as well so that that, re that really helped me yeah good uh, i mean that that's that's i mean that's pretty much how uh, I, from a number of the people that I've spoken with that, you know, in-house training seems to be a, 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 not a standard starting point, but a good starting point for most. Uh, one common thing that seems to be sort of connecting all of these is that there was someone in management that provided an opportunity to you. And, um, and obviously you were keen and in showing interest, but um, for many of us, it seems like there needs to be, or we can, as working in management, we can provide those opportunities for potential trainers um and you know for myself i was provided that opportunity for the director that, that i was working under uh and yourself you were given those opportunities um it, I, I suppose the, these fun chats have really helped me realize the importance of having that sort of supportive management sort of environment that, that allows teachers to experiment you know maybe they don't like training or maybe they're you know they try it once and they and they just you know and they run a session and it was terrible and then it's like never again but I, I think it's important to you know have that environment in which they can that they they can experiment would you i mean would you agree yeah i, mean, I think so there's i mean at the end of the day um the, i think school managers need people to run or hopefully need people to run cpd sessions if they're part of an accredited scheme um, accredited network of schools there's normally some requirement to have some kind of in-house cpd so okay. i think um, school managers are looking for people who have an interest, who are willing to spend that little bit of extra time just yeah. putting, um, a, a, let's say, um, a, an in-house training session together, be it a, a lunchtime 20-minute one or uh, one every month for an hour or run a teacher club or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I think as I kind of uh, got more involved in management, not just management of my qualifications, but teams and so on, um, I, I learned more about the, the kind of competing priorities and that when we're looking at individuals' goals and individuals' targets and what we want to do, um, I think it's very easy for an individual to look at themselves and say, well, I want to be here. How do I get to, do, how, how can I get to this point? And we often think about ourselves just as our own unit. Um, but I think the best way we can kind of help meet our goals is to consider also the needs of our colleagues in our department, right. but also the needs of the school. And there are kind of, it's almost like you have a Venn diagram of three areas. There's your mm. needs, your colleagues or department needs, or your manager's needs, and your school's needs. Mm. And they all, and at the point where they overlap, that intersection where they overlap, I think if that's where you can aim your, uh, your skills, your interests, or you, let's say your training, then I think you, you can be seen very quickly by a manager to say, actually, well, I need someone to do this, this, and this. And this person is, is focusing their attention in this area, which overlaps these, these circles. Um, and so I think that's the way you, you can kind of make yourself noticed um, a bit more. So I think definitely it needs someone to notice you um, and be willing to help you. But mm. I think as an individual, I think as a teacher wanting to do more training or indeed as a trainer wanting to do more training, um, uh, then I think you can help yourself by looking at the broader picture, taking a step back and saying, well, 
it's not just about my goal to become, let's say, a Cert T Solar Salsa trainer. It's about my goal to help, let's say, the school through their next inspection. And by doing that, there's this and the other. And all that will help me come, become maybe um, uh, the, the kind of teacher trainer that I want to be. But there are various steps along the way to get there. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I haven't actually we haven't spoken about that, but it's definitely something, uh, you know, for, for aspiring teacher trainers in a sense, you know, looking for that area where the you know, school, the institutions needs uh, what they need. That's a, that, that's that's a really interesting point. Um, now moving into teacher training is not without its challenges for 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 anyone, I don't think. Um, and but I I also think the challenges are quite individual at times. Um, have, have, have there been any challenges that, that sort of come to mind where you're like, oh, okay, I had to really think about that, or you know, this was quite difficult? Um, and if there were, how did you overcome these? Um, yeah, I, I mean, so, so many challenges. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's often uh, in academic, academia, they talk about, and in many other places, talk about critical incidents. Mm. Uh, and uh, you experience a critical incident and how you react to that and learn from that helps shape your development and professional self and personal self. Um, so I think there are lots of critical incident, incidents, uh, which are the kind of more major things. But I mean, on the, I mean, there are also kind of more mundane kind of things where, let's say, um, uh, if, if, uh, the n- amount of hours you need to put in when you're becoming a trainer. Yeah. So just when you start teaching and you might when I started teaching for every hour I was teaching, I was, I was planning an hour as well, pretty much when I started. So I really didn't know what I was doing. And then of course it gets to the stage where you can plan for five minutes and teach an hour. You, you, you get to that level. So a similar thing with, with teacher training, you, you're almost back to the beginning and thinking, well, I need all this time to just put together this one session. I'll make sure these yeah. materials are right. So, so I think there's, it's important to have an understanding that um, it takes time. And that uh, you, you need to put the time in. And a lot of it is unpaid work, arguably, you could say. Um, but it, it's unpaid work, but it's, it's you're investing in your own development. You're investing yeah. in your future. You're investing in your knowledge. So I think to look at it as unpaid work, as sometimes people do, I think it's to take a very binary look at something, a binary approach. And I think looking at it as how you're, you've got an opportunity to develop yourself is probably how I, I kind of overcame that thing about how many hours am I putting in here um, to, to do this work. So I think that that's, that's kind of one thing. Um, there are other kind of mundane things, like when you're trying to um, arrange um, observations of experienced teachers. So most qualifications require you, uh, a, a trainee a course participant, to watch other teachers. Um, and it's very difficult to find teachers who are happy to be observed sometimes. Right. Uh, and so you're having to... Um, use all of your personal skills, you know, pull in favors and do all kinds of things, just to try and find a class for, for some teachers, some, some trainee teachers to observe. And, and so there are basic things like that, like timetabling things that, that are just part of the day-to-day running of a, a teacher education course. On the other side of things, um, people are people and, <laughs> and, and, and they come with all of the, the pros and cons that people come with. So um you can teach a course and it'll be absolutely marvelous and everyone's lovely and they really give you lots of energy back and you, you come away feeling really high uh, but equally you can teach a course uh, i've been on courses where um either me or tutors have had have been um, accused of racism misogyny um or many w- one of many other things um and of course it has to be looked into um in all of these cases, none of the complaints were ever upheld. It just ended up being that they were unha- someone thought they should get a, an above, um, uh, was a, like a distinction or uh, above standard at this stage of a course. And in fact, the, the tutor gave them a two standard, let's say. Um, and then and then they got upset and said, well, what the reason this person is giving me this is because of my background or my ethnicity or my gender or my uh, sexual orientation or something. Um, and so I think learning to deal with uh, learning to work with um, people, I think, is a really, really important sk- skill to have. And also learning what the, the right processes and procedures are to make sure that any complaints, any problems are investigated thoroughly, mm. because you, you don't want someone to have uh, a bias on your course, you want your tutors, and you, but you also need to give them the, your support and respect. So I think there are, and you, you really just want to make sure you, you do everything absolutely correctly to make sure that 
um, everyone's needs are being properly met. So I think those that those are some really um, difficult challenges. But anyone who's been in in teacher education will know that that this is just what happens. Yeah. That uh, people get upset, and 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 uh, you need to deal with that. So I think. Um, learning to deal with people, learning to empathize with people, learning about why people are people and the way that they are um, is probably is one of the biggest things, challenges, but also ultimately really rewarding because by learning about others, you also learn about yourself uh, and you can then learn about how to uh, just make, again, it gets back to the thing about how to make things better for other people. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, you've covered a lot there. <laughs> um, uh, they, that, that seems like obviously quite large organizational stuff as well. Um, you know, looking at organizing the courses and that set, but also dealing with sort of the effective issues of, of, of working with people, right? Um, on such a large scale, I haven't actually been involved. You know, I'm still quite a junior trainer myself. Um, and so I haven't been involved in large, you know, accredited courses. Um, but I can definitely imagine, like from my own experience dealing with teachers, for example, maybe there's a, a negative observation, maybe there is a critical incident and it needs to be you know, spoken about and, and teachers need to be coached and, and need to be, to be helped to reflect on that and see that something was wrong. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't always go to according to plan. Um, it, it, it doesn't. And I think one of the, the, the all you can really do is is be honest and approachable. Uh, and I think people tend to react very well to honesty and, and, and being approachable. Uh, and I think in that way, we're able to get the best out of people and just to, uh, and the importance of listening to them and never going it, never prejudging, but always just listening and, and just trying to find out what people need and taking and treating each person as an individual. Um, and it can be very difficult sometimes when you know your workload is, is backed up. You've got loads of observations to do or write-ups of observations to do. Um, but all teaching is a very personal profession. Um, and it's sometimes it's very difficult for a teacher and indeed a teacher trainer to, di- to make sure there's clear separation between the teacher and the teaching. Um, and that what you're assessing is the teaching, not necessarily the, not the, the teacher. teacher. Um, and and sometimes it, it helps just to remind yourself of that and also in one's feedback just to make sure that's really clear as well to help uh, overcome that but as i say just this kind of approach of being honest and and listening uh, and just hearing what people have to say and just really considering that i think can really help yeah i mean i i would definitely second that um i suppose one of the things that, that i still find difficult is this idea of uh listening and but really listening, really, really listening without putting mm, your own uh, thoughts or um, ideas before the teachers, you know, that, that they can come later in a sense. Um, and, you know, this, especially in feedback sessions, whether it's positive or negative, you know, or whatever, uh, really listening and, and, and taking on what they're saying and not imposing your thoughts and ideas I still find that quite difficult at times because of the, for example I know you know from research if something is good for learners you know that we should be doing it but we can't you can't impose that on teachers and, and I still find that sometimes that's something I have to uh, you know after the session I've, I, you know, I, I usually write reflective notes and I say oh maybe for next time I, I shouldn't ask that question maybe I should ask something else and so that's definitely something that I, that I find difficult still um, I think just just on on that point, there's um I know later on you're going to ask me about some books and so on, but there's yeah. um a, a nice point here to raise probably one of my favourite articles. Um, so it's not a book, but it's a freely available article uh online from Google Scholar UCL, um, which is all about micro ideologies. Um, and it, the title of it is along the lines of uh, the things we think we ought to do. Um, and it's about teacher training and how teacher trainers can influence their peers and on their um uh, and, and trainees through their own micro ideologies right uh, by right. saying what is right and what is wrong uh, and it's a, a nice thing to actually question why we do something so for yeah. example I, I, my, my particular bugbear is anyone who's ever been a trainee of mine will know that i hate inappropriate capitalization on the board <laughs> <laughs> a minor bugbear but there we go it's that there. and so if someone writes entirely in capitals on the board or let's say on the screen um it it annoys you because it's like that's that's inappropriate it's, it's bad practice 
Um, and you know, so, some languages use capitals in many different in different ways to the way we do in English. So it's akin to misspelling or or bad grammar or inappropriate capitalization form. Well, it is punctuation. Um, but then I, I have to think, well, how important that is the grand scheme of a lesson, you know. And on my, if I look, were to look back at my early uh, tutor feedback notes, um, I'd be mentioning this, and it's like, well, there are lots of other things to mention, but I'm choosing this micro ideology, the thing I've chosen. Yeah. Uh, and then one wonders, how does that impact their their uh, professional growth? Um, and because they're just at the start of their career and they're getting this, and I'm prioritizing it because it's my bugbear. Fine. Um, but I think as long as we, as long as tutors know that they have their own bugbear, that they have their own micro ideologies, they know this and recognize what it is, yeah. then they're perhaps better able to use it or avoid it judiciously according to the context and see, well, actually, is it better to focus on another thing instead? So I think, as, as you suggest, um, trying to set aside your beliefs is I think really good and actually just looking at what's appropriate for the context mm. and we might come we might have done our, our whatever teach training course and we go into a context and we say right everyone needs to be doing this um, but the, what we might do in um, a private language school in Zaragoza might be very different from what we do in a clear lesson in Valencia exactly. um, you know, that, because the class is entirely different and, and there isn't a one size fits all I think we need to be really aware of that um and i think just be sensitive to the surroundings um and also sensitive to what we're saying and why we're saying it as well so really um uh, on, on a kind of philosophical bent if you will uh, pierre bourdieu talks about turning the uh, the lens of reflection back on oneself mm -hmm. so kind of looking at why you do what you do um he talks about looking into the kitchens of decision making, the kind of back rooms of decision making. So he uses a kind of kitchen analogy to say, well, let's not look at what the chef has done. Let's look at what, how the chef is doing it. Right. And as you kind of where in terms of our decision making, we look at that. And so why have I decided to produce this dish in the way I have done um, and, and turn that lens of attention? on oneself so uh, i think that's a re really sorry that's a very long kind of responding comment to yours <laughs> but i i really really agree with that no no that's that's that, that's really interesting i'm definitely going to have a read of that it, it seems to echo i recently finished uh right and bolitho 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 i never know how to say it um but their book trainer development which is focused on developing trainers um but i still think there are many things you know that are applicable to, to training teachers but they were talking about trainer bias and the similar to micro ideologies no um and how we need to be aware that if we are biased against something that we're not bringing that in unless it's un unless necessary um and you know i i recently did a write-up of the, the the program that we did for the last terms course and i found that my own bias, like i identified my own bias my, my love for task-based language teaching sort of crept in and and i sort of imposed that on one of the sessions and and so i, I reflected on that and i said teachers enjoyed it but it wasn't from their needs and wants um so you know there are things that i need to think about for that um but like you said it's turning that reflective lens and I, I i you know we often push this idea of reflection reflection in and on practice with, with teachers but i think even more so um, as trainers, you know, we should be leading by example and reflecting on our on, on ourselves. Um, and and yeah, I suppose that leads us quite nicely into to the next question, which is, and I, I think I I know what you you're going to talk about is what makes a good trainer. I mean, you you yourself you you're you're, uh, you're involved quite heavily with 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 training for qualifications, and and you've obviously you've worked in training trainers as well. Um, so what does make it a good trainer? um do you think in in the general sense um and that's a really good question i think my a lot of people maybe when they think about becoming a trainer they think they need to be academically good and they think well i need let's say i've done my piece of data i need to know all about i don't know sla and etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i would say no that that's entirely secondary um i think the for me i think the most important thing for a teacher trainer is empathy and people skills mm. um being able to understand where people are coming from and how we can help them reach their goals and help them actually identify their goals. Now, if, if we're looking at um, a kind of uh, more kind of 
bespoke kind of one-to-one -one teacher training or teacher support. Let's say we've got a manager or some academic managers, academic support, and an individual teacher after an observation. Then, um, then you, you need to kind of co-construct goals as to what targets might be or how you can help teachers reach something that will be beneficial for them, the school, the students. Yep. And so you get those different uh, areas of priority, but like the managing kind of three circles I talked about before, well, what's good for the students, what's good for the teacher, what's good for the department, and trying to focus some kind of development based on that. Um, when it comes to some uh, like a, a, an accredited course, let's say the Delta or Dip TESOL, then you don't need to negotiate those goals because those targets are expressed oh, yes, by yeah. the exam board. You say, well, this is what you need to get to. And then you're, then I think the, the trainer's role is to help identify where the tutor is, where the teacher is and help them get to that level. So, um, so yes, I'd say it's, it's about people skills. It's about understanding how to help people, understanding how to diagnose people, um, a teacher skills. But of course, in order to do that, you need to understand about, yes language if we're looking at language teaching but also we need to understand about a progression of pedagogical skills relevant to a context um that's let's say if we're looking at kind of one-to-one -one teacher support if you're looking at um, an accredited course revision then you need to understand inside out what are the requirements for um, a pass at certain levels um, and, and i always find it amusing sometimes on, on facebook forums etc where um tutors will argue or discuss what's the difference between let's say a CELTA grade A and a CELTA grade B um, and the and what's interesting is that lots of tutors do not know the difference they say well actually it's really it's a, like it's a really great lesson it's an outstanding lesson you know, knock the ball out of the park etc um, but actually that's not what the criteria says from Cambridge about what makes it, uh, what makes a, a CELTA A it's all about the lesson planning mm -hmm. uh, document so it, it's like there are things where like, there are misconceptions right so I think um, it's really important for teacher trainers to know what what their what their um, what their subject is, and not to apply their own micro ideology of saying, "Well, a self array must just be absolutely perfect." Well, no, that's not what a self array is, um, and, and just to be aware of these things. So, for a whole variety of things. So, in order to be, be being a good teacher trainer, um, so I think someone, as I say, someone who can empathise, they know what they're talking about. In order to do that. I think they need, to, in many cases, it helps if they speak from experience um, and they speak honestly and they speak professionally. And I think being honest about your own experience, um, being honest about what you know and what you don't know, um, ultimately is good because it helps people place your, your level of support into where, where it needs to be. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think that's, and with that comes the kind of academic knowledge about knowing what. Uh, people need to achieve pedagogically. You've got the vocational knowledge of, well, let's say, what an exam board need. We've also got the local knowledge of what your students need. And then there's the understanding of the teacher themselves, which really underpins the whole thing. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, um, especially the part that you mentioned about um, you know, if you're having standards, if there's, if, there's, if there's, a, for example, a goal, a course goal, and I'm talking on sort of certified courses here, um, I recently wrote an article in, in, on sort of developing teachers assessment literacy and the idea of co-constructing knowledge and, and you know, looking at the, the criteria together and discussing is this what this actually means and it seems like that's actually important not only for, for assessment but in terms of understanding course objectives as well. Um, you know I haven't actually worked on a certified course but I can imagine the, the interpretation of you know what is a pass A or a pass B um, can be quite difficult. And if it's at one level, it's only one teacher doing it, then there's going to be room for those micro ideologies to sneak in. And so I think one of the things that, that, that I would say, you know, that trainers should do is always look to work with other trainers or, or to, 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 you know, get, I suppose, get feedback, discuss thoughts and, and don't, don't just stay, stay by yourself. That would be I think that's a, a really good suggestion. I mean, I think the, and another kind of, I think, really good quality of a teacher trainer, and we've talked about the ability to listen, but I think the importance of being quite humble and, and recognising that you, you can be wrong on a whole variety of things um, and uh, recognising that you will be wrong um, and that other people <laughs> will have a better answer uh, and, and just remembering that. Um, and that whilst I, I might be the go-to person for advice about Trinity qualifications, um or trinity teaching qualifications um if you if you want me to talk about 
um, the best uh, way to teach CLIL in Nepal, then I'm not going to, I can offer some general suggestions, but I'm really not the person to go to. Yeah. Um, and re I think recognizing your strengths, but also your weaknesses mm. um, is going to be really, really important. And listening to others and getting that experience of others is a really good way to help identify those strengths and weaknesses and to Clear. build your own knowledge as well. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Now, you did mention um, sort of the dip TESOL or Delta or diploma level qualification. And I've spoken about this with a number of trainers before. Um, but I, I always ask this question. Do you think that the dip TESOL or the Delta prepares you to become a trainer? Um, I think it doesn't prepare you in itself to be, be a trainer. So I think um, that's not what the qualifications aim to do. I mean, if we look at um, modules one, two, and three of the of the Delta, or um, I mean, the the exam is really about language knowledge and student need. Um, the um, module two about course, uh, sorry, that's a lesson observations case. Well, that's about attending to students in the classroom. And module three course planning. So there's not there are things there which help build your knowledge to become a teacher trainer. They help give you a depth of knowledge about teaching and language. But do they help you become a trainer per se? I think, no, you need more than that. Similar thing with the dip TESOL. Dip TESOL, similar thing, unit one, the written exam, it's about language knowledge. There is a bit in professional support in the third section of the exam, but again, it's about professional development and support relevant to your context. So it kind of touches on that. Um, the unit two research piece in the dip TESOL um, is quite flexible. So you could focus on teacher training as yeah. a research area. Um, but then unit three is a phonology interview, unit four, the teaching practice. So I think the knowledge you get from doing the Delta or the TESOL is essential in helping you become a better trainer yeah. because it gives you the, uh, the vocational um, kind of context. It gives you a pedagogic understanding and it gives you an academic insight, um, which not doing it wouldn't give you. So I think if someone said, do I need to do the dip or Delta um, in order to become a teacher trainer? I would say not necessarily, but you'll be, I think you'd be much better in English language teaching if you did do the dip or delta. Uh, and in many cases, in fact, for the Trinity qualifications, it's a prerequisite that you have at least right. for a course tutor, a minimum, that you have a pass in the teaching practicum of the dip or delta or another level seven, a master's level teaching qualification. And you can't be a course leader until you have got a level seven, a full level seven qualification which includes teaching practicum so just an MA an, an academic MA won't do the job you need to have an academic MA or an MA which includes assessed teaching at level seven um, because I really believe that that the, the knowledge you gain from that and indeed the experience of reflecting on that and how that reflection then changes your practice so we move from reflection which ends in c-t-i-o-n to reflection x-i-o-n where it kind of changes what you are and who you are as a professional, I think that, that really happens uh, when you look deeply into the change, the transitional and transformative nature of the, these level seven qualifications. Brilliant, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much exactly, I mean, you said it very, very eloquently, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's pretty much what, we, what, what everyone has said. Um, you know, we, we mentioned that these diploma level courses, they really help develop you as a teacher, being critical of yourself and, um, understanding what it's like to receive feedback at that level. Um, and, you know, I, for, for myself, you know, I looked at when I, when, I, when, I, when I did the Delta and it changed completely. You know, what, what, you know, I went into the Delta thinking I knew what I was doing and the Delta just showed me how much I didn't know. <laughs> and then, uh, but it also gave me the experience of, of working with very, very proficient trainers. And, you know, the, now that I reflect back on how they were providing feedback or how they were helping me to reflect on my practice, it was, it was very good for that as a trainer when I reflect back on that. But yeah, I completely agree. I think it's, uh, it develops you as a teacher. I don't think it's 100% necessary, but I do think um, it is a good step to take before becoming a trainer. I, I'll say it like that. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, you can learn the same things that you learn um, you, you learn on a, a dip tease or delta without doing the dip tease or delta. Um, but the, the, the industry that we're in or the profession that we're in um, kind of packages it up relatively neatly so that there is a way to codify this and acknowledge that you have skills at a certain level. Um, and I suppose that's what exam boards and assessments are all about. It's about demonstrating you have a certain skill at a certain level um, so that other people can trust you have this, this particular level 
Um, and in some cases, that's just a, a necessary uh, part of the world that we live in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I do see value in qualifications, though. Um, I, I do... I mean, obviously, you're, you're head of qualifications for Trinity, so I'm imagining that you do as well. But, you know, I, you know we've spoken about this before with some other people. And uh, yes, I, I do think you can do a lot of it yourself. But having that, I'm going to say pressure, but also having done something that's accredited, I think lends a lot of weight to your professional profile, if, if, if we say it like that. Um, yeah, so- absolutely. It's... Um, uh, it, it, it helps. It, it, these are recognised things, and society functions, uh, and different levels of high, uh, of society and different roles in society function by uh, the recognition of having something, uh, some kind of um, uh, c- kind of social capital, um, and there are different types of capital that you might have. So, and a qualification is a type of kind of uh, cultural capital um, that that you build. Uh, and therefore that helps you with your with your profile and it just um, makes things it, it can make things a lot easier and I say for standardization purposes it's really helpful but um, of course you can learn so much but in not doing a qualification but it depends on on the type of individual and you may be someone who uh, works really really well um, in a collaborative environment and is terrible at exams and if you're terrible at exams then the delta module one or the dipteso unit one are going to be really problematic and you could be a great a, you know a great teacher but really struggle with this yeah. but the nature of the qualifications are that these this is a hoop you have to jump through so to speak yeah. um uh, so yeah I, I think it, it again it depends on the individual and there are different types of qualification and routes to a destination um that you can get to so it may be that an ma is a better way of, of getting into that route than necessarily a dip or delta um, or a PGCE, a state take the PGCE. So it doesn't have to be um, like a tr- traditional ELT qualification, but there are many different paths um, to learning. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, I suppose that actually leads us quite nicely onto the next part as well, which is sort of the future uh, of, of language teacher education. I, I remember watching, um, I think it was one of your webinars and it looked at the impact of, of correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it was it was a, a good month or so that I watched it. It was uh, the impact of language teacher education in in the pandemic, um, and it got me really thinking about um, you know what what's training going to be like or teacher education in general, not just sort of internal training, but what's what's teacher education going to be like over the next few years? Are there going to be any substantial changes? Are is or is it just going to stay the same? Um, I'd like to get your perspective. I mean, uh, really interesting. And yes, the, the, I think the, the talk um, you went to was uh, on um, a new online training course, which Trinity is soon to release and about the impact of that. So uh, we finished the course and as part of course cr- our course creation, uh, we ran um, a pilot and we ran an impact study just to check whether or not um, actually pre- the impact post course right. for um, self-reporting questionnaires of teachers actually was uh, any good and thankfully the, the impact of this course is really really good so I'm looking forward <laughs> to being uh, in, in September so more on that on the Trinity College site uh, to come yeah um, but in the kind of general thing um, what changes are going to happen I mean I think last year we had just a, a, a fundamental paradigm shift in how we viewed um, teacher education um, to give an example at the start of the when the pandemic uh, COVID pandemic hit kind of a uh, western Europe let's say around March uh, last year I had a kind of informal uh, discussion with a variety of teachers and school managers and trainers uh, and said about what, how do you feel about having online teaching assessment mm. like through Zoom or, or Teams or something like this. Uh, and most, almost all of the people I spoke to said that this would be terrible. The industry would fall on its head. Um, everything would crash and burn. Civilization would end. Um, it would like to be tidal waves and the whole world would be terrible if we did such a thing. It was, it was, everyone was very pessimistic about it. said it can't happen. Then one month later, at the end of April, the pandemic has kind of taken a bit more of a toll. Schools are having to move online. uh, And I asked a very similar group of people, a similar number of people, the same thing. And it almost completely changed. Almost everybody I spoke to said it's fundamental that online training is part of every single teacher training course. Um, And this is, you know, the complete opposite of what people have said just one month before. Mm. Um, And I think that that change going from in-person to online teaching assessment um, would 
I would imagine would normally take a decade or two decades to take place, but this happened within a month because of necessity and, and people's livelihoods, their businesses, schools, education in general depended on it. And we've, we've had over a year now of finding actually that the world hasn't ended, the sky hasn't fallen on our heads yeah. Um, yeah. and that teaching and training can go on. Um, and so much so that actually we've now got quite a few examples of hybrid learning as well, not just online and where you get some, te- some students in person, some students online, it's fantastic for accessibility issues. And if you have that facility to do that, then people can learn effectively that way. So I think the biggest change, which I think we'll see in our lifetimes, has just happened. Yeah. Um, that huge shift to online teaching. So online teaching isn't going away. Yet people still prefer in-person teaching, um, in-person training. So I think we're just going to see a variety of methods, a variety of modes, rather, of training. So I think that that's one thing that will continue. Mm. So that's some kind of practical delivery side and there are pedagogical issues that need to be unpicked about that about the difference in pedagogy and online learning and some of the things to understand about um, the differences of in-person and online teaching and that's incidentally what one of the things this new course from trinity is going to explore is about how teachers can develop their skills in an online specifically in an online environment interesting um, on the other side of that um i think you've also you've also got um the the, the long issue about um uh, those who have English as a first and uh, and an additional language, uh, and what in it, which is something really nice that we see is that there's becoming less of a reliance on teachers who or people who have English as a first language being brought in to teach and then being given um, jobs just because they happen to speak English as a first language right. over people yeah. English as an additional language. Uh, and I think this is slowly changing. Um, in some countries, it's further ahead than others. Um, but I think. uh, we can look forward to more localization of teaching and and development of teachers and uh, maybe I think more focus on in-service teacher development rather than just bring in some people who have English as a first language and they only get um, pre-service training and that's it. And I think the pandemic actually has, I think, helped accelerate this as well because it's prevented teachers from flying around the world and getting jobs in all these different places and schools have had to rely on um, the local um, local teachers and local skills. And I think this is absolutely fabulous um, because it's removing a kind of English uh, native speaker hegemony, which I, I think is, is problematic. Um, and it re- recognizes the skills of a teacher rather than whether or not they have English as the first language. So I, I think that's the other side of, of things uh, in terms of the future of teaching. More localized teacher support, um, and do, I'm going to a little plug here, but of course, the new certificate for practicing teachers, the uh, qualification Trinity launched at the beginning of last year, um, is all about supporting teachers and includes bilingual assessment. So mm. for those in Spain, um, you can have the um, uh, do the cert PT and do your assessment in English and Spanish or a mixture uh, of English and Spanish or in English or in Spanish. Um, because what we're interested in is the pedagogy. We're not interested in whether or not you speak English. It's what you is. Do you know how to teach? It's a teaching yeah. qualification. Yeah. Um, so I think this localized teaching and online teaching and hybrid teaching are some really big changes. Uh, and that's, I think, almost certainly uh, going to be um, a big part of the future of teaching. Brilliant. That's absolutely amazing. Uh... You know, just on that, that was the CERT PT. Is that correct? The, the Trinity CERT. That's right. It's a, that's a short name for the Certificate for Practicing Teachers. So it's a yeah. level six qualification. So it sits between certificate uh, and diploma levels. Mm. You can find out more at trinitycollege.com forward slash CERT PT. I'll make sure to put links down. I actually saw it the other day. I was looking at it um, and it, it seems quite interesting. Um, what I really like what, what you said now, and I think this links to another um presentation that you gave is the future is sort of is plurilingual and um you know much of what i'm focusing on now i, I just finished writing an article uh, that, that focused on sort of the, the the sort of the dichotomy of the you know the native non-native speaker dichotomy and how how damaging this rhetoric can be um and you know when you when we reflect on sort of the actual practice of teachers um and you know i think that's absolutely brilliant that we're bringing in this this, this plurilingual approach because teachers you know th- th- they can why why does that 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 native you know that that sort of their their mother tongue why does that have to be stigmatized for, for, for the classroom right? and indeed i mean i think what's what's um for me of course you can have well, you can have lower level qualifications entry level qualifications where um, you don't need to have, let's say, you can maybe pass with a B1 or, or low B2 level of English, perhaps. But 
because of the nature of qualifications, the higher level you go, the more academically able you need to be able to be. And to express those academic concepts, you need to have a higher level of English. Yeah. Um, so the majority of teachers around the world have a language level below B2. Uh, according to what the British Council, something like one and a half million people teach English around the world. Of those, 1.25 million have English as an additional language. And of those, about a million have English at, at low B2 or lower. Um, and when we look at most teacher education programs, um, the uh, the kind of gateway kind of, or, or gatekeeping language inference uh, language level is a B2 C1. Mm. So it's almost like we're, we're restricting the traditional ELT environment is restricting pedagogical development to those who have good English, yeah. um, even yeah. though you've got a million people around the world who are teaching and, and they, they need that pedagogical support, but they yeah. just can't get it. That may be that they're only teaching A1 students, so they only need A2 or B or let's say B1 level, levels of English. So I think having a qualification which is bilingual or translingual and enables a switching between languages is absolutely fine when you look at the context and it comes yeah. back to this thing which i think is really important about localization and recognizing that teacher support needs to be relevant to its local context and if that context is that you only teach a what a1 a2 when you only need b1 b2 then then of course we can try and help you do that so that's what this new qualification helps teachers to do so you can be you have english as a first language and still do the qualification and do it in english or you can do it in spanish or in, in mandarin chinese or whatever um but the and the language of assessment is indicated on the certificate but that there's that's i think a, a really important thing about just let's say taking away the stigma um of not having english as a first language and i, I think in, in, and refocusing it on pedagogical skills that's excellent. Not the refocusing the need and the, the the recognition, rather. No, no, of course. Um, yeah, that that's 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 really interesting. I, I read a um, an article uh, recently uh, from the Rutledge Handbook of, of Second Language Teacher Education by by Selvi, and he talks about uh, a model that was presented by Pasternak and Bailey in I think two thousand and four, and rather than looking at teachers as non native or native, which kind of takes away the idea of you know professional competence. Yeah, we can kind of look at them on on two sort of continua, with you know proficiency in English, combined with uh, proficiency in teaching, and you know that that qualification seems to really take that in mind. You know, we're looking at yes, they can still develop their proficiency in English, but that pedagogic knowledge is is vital. You know, um, and and just because you're native doesn't mean you have that pedagogic knowledge, right? <laughs> so, uh, no, I think that's 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 really amazing that that course is focusing on that and that allowing that sort of that dual approach. Um, no, okay, there's a lot of a lot of stuff there for me to sort of to to, to take apart. Uh, when I watch this again, I'll be like, oh, it's like, I should have asked another question, but I haven't got any more questions literally for that at the moment. Um, I suppose my next question is focusing on. Teachers in various contexts around the world may see this or may, may be thinking about, you know, maybe I'd like to try training. Um, and I, I suppose we've touched on quite a few points already, but if you had to think of two or three specific pieces of advice for teachers that feel confident to really take that step to move into or to try teacher training, what, what would those pieces of advice be? I think the, uh, the first one would be to try and get experience teaching there's many different contexts and there's many different um, types of English language as, as, as you can. Um, because I think um, Tom, when you were interviewing Tom Kiddle, he, he was talking about the, um, the need to, uh, that you can be a kind of generalist, but also actually when, when you're running in many, many teacher training courses, you need to know about X. Um, and you can only really know about X if you've really taught X or been involved with X. So I think um, ha having a broad base is really important, but also having a specialism. So I think getting experience will help you with that. So I think that's the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing would be to share that experience and that knowledge willingly and freely. Um, and I think this freely and willingly is two slightly separate things. Um, but the, the, if you look at what is teacher training, I mean, is teacher training a job title? Is teacher training... Um, just something you do during a lunch hour is teacher training or putting up a blog post. I mean, all of this is teacher training. So I think understanding what teacher training is and just doing that it, yeah. with relevance to that sector, which I think is this sharing freely and willingly with your peers to co-create knowledge, to construct knowledge, to guide teachers, to coach teachers. And that's part of this kind of sharing. 
Um, I think the, the third piece um, to say is, is to uh, build qualifications um, for kind of experience. Um, and the, the world of academia um, and ELT will, will call it kind of academia rather than a, a kind of a, an industry, although arguably it's a bit of both. It's like in order to help teachers acquire knowledge, you're helping them build skills and build, build knowledge. And in order to get the kinds of roles, if you want a role as a teacher trainer, um, you will need to have higher level qualifications. Um, you can't teach someone on a Delta or a Dip TESOL if you've only got a Celta or a Cert TESOL level qualification. You just don't have that knowledge or experience. So um, it, you always kind of need to be one level ahead of at least of where your, your, your group are, uh, that your teacher trainers are. So um, for three things, they build experience, share willingly and freely. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Ben. Uh, plenty of, uh, I mean, th those those things cover quite a lot there. I really like, I mean, connecting it to what Tom said about, you know, building experience in, and, and yes, of course, specializing in a sense, but knowing what you're talking about. Um, even now I think about, you know, I'm still working at, in sort of an inset program and there's a lot of things that we're focusing on. It's my, my role, the way I view myself is, is, is a mediator. And, and, and helping teachers there. But there's still things where I would like, for example, I love task-based language teaching. And so that's something that I, that, I, that I love doing. And perhaps in the future, I'd like to work on courses that, that focus on, on that. So that, that, that's my sort of focus for the next few years, I, I suppose. Um, but I can definitely see the value of, you know, if you want to train people in CLIL, make sure, you're, make sure you have plenty of experience in CLIL, right? Um, and, 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 and I think, if you are put on a course to train teachers in something that you don't have experience with, I think you're running a risk, I don't know, um, of getting caught out, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of being caught out. But I think it goes back to the thing about being honest about what you know. Um, and if, if you're there delivering someone else's material, fine. I mean, you can, if it's right. just a case of delivery and you've got enough notes and you've done your preparation, I mean, you can deliver it, you could, deliver a session um, that someone else has written with you know enough preparation but I don't think you're going to be very good at delivering that session you could only ever just deliver that session as it's been written right. um, you won't be able to make the links between that session and other sessions or that link to another or that session and other areas uh, and um, was it the was what makes what makes great teaching there was um, I forget the name of the foundation it was maybe five years ago there was a report um, published and uh, freely available on the internet, which I think if you put in what makes great teaching, let's see if I can find the link for you. Um, it says that, that basically it was a meta-analysis of, of lots of, kind of good teaching techniques. Um, and they kind of boiled it down to six key areas at what makes good teaching and by extension training. Um, and one of them was that teachers can make connections between previous learning new learning or future learning and so on and i think if you go in just doing someone else's session yes you can do that and indeed i do that when i was start start out as a teacher trainer i was pushed in front of a room and said here just deliver this it'll be fine <laughs> um, and and indeed it was fine i just you know it just wasn't as good as i could have been because i, I didn't know where those links to other things were um so yeah uh, th i think that that kind of experience really helps helps you in that case yeah I suppose this, um, I mean, just before we get into the books, this idea of the one-off session then. Now, the more, I, the more I train, the more I work with teachers. I know I present at conferences, I have my own sessions, but I've also presented, for example, for, for Cambridge University Press and assessment. Um, you know, and the more I work with teachers, the more I see the value in, in having those, those, those sessions that have a coherent theme and then they, they build that depth of knowledge or, and sometimes I, I, sometimes I, I worry about the value of the one-off session. Does that make sense? Sometimes I worry about connecting it to teacher's practice. And so, so for that hour that I'm with them, it needs to be amazing. It needs to be amazing. Um, you know, and sometimes I deliver a session and I, and I think, oof, I mean, it was good. They were happy. The teachers came back, but inside, I know that it, it wasn't really connected to their practice. It wasn't really, you know, and, and, and so. Well, I, I, I think 
I, I mean, I think you're right to worry, but I wouldn't worry too much. Um, that because your experience and what you, you feel is was very different from what others will, will, will feel. Yeah. Um, and an hour, for, an hour is a, you know for one off session. You know, that's a, ch a chunk of time. Um, and a lot of things happen in that hour that, that you won't you won't be aware of as a teacher, as a trainer, as when I teach, you know, I'm not aware of what's going on in the people's minds and so on. Uh, and yes, ideally, um, I if we're doing a teacher training, it's linked to a teacher's practice. However, there are many types of training and it could be that what a particular teacher needs at that particular time is something a bit more academic. Right. It might be that they need something particularly lightweight. It may, might be that they, I know that they, they want to watch I know The Simpsons for an hour, uh, and and there's something they get from watching Homer Simpson, which gives them a particular insight into what they do in their own teaching. I've certainly um, learned from Homer Simpson in my own teaching and, and kind of experience. And you, you, you know, you take inspiration and experience from many different places. Yeah. So I think yes, one-off training sessions have a place. Um, I think they if if the world consisted only of one-off, one-hour training sessions, I'd say that's problematic. Mm. If the world cons only consisted of regulated courses that let end in a certificate, I would also say that's a problem. But there's a, there's a place for everything in between, uh, from the highly practical to the highly academic. And the audience are going to get very, very different things from each of these. So I think what's, what's really important, perhaps, in these kind of sessions is, first of all, at the beginning, to kind of state what kind of session it is. Yeah. And at the end, kind of review what session it's been. And whilst you're doing it throughout, maybe have a variety of threads where the threads, if it's not eminently practical, say, well, you could you could maybe think about how you can make this practical by doing ABC and just have a light thread, like comment to it. And sometimes that can be enough to stimulate a teacher's interests. Um, so I'm not going to say make every session academic or every session practical, <laughs> because it, it, it really depends on the aims of the session and also what the, what the teachers are there for. And sometimes, um, sometimes what we just need is something quite light, something quite refreshing. And it doesn't really, it doesn't need to be your perfect session. Of course, your perfect session is perfect for you. But if we go back to those micro ideologies, what, course, what we yeah. talk about, what, what, what is that perfect session for you, a perfect session for another? So mm. I think, yes, I'm not saying don't do your best, of course, or any <laughs> teacher thing, but do your best, but do your best, but don't worry. Don't, don't I'd say don't worry too much, but remember, um, I think there's another uh, theorist I'll refer to, Brookfield, uh, talks about lenses, four lenses. Um, and it's a, it's a type of reflection. So many people know about Gibbs or, or, or maybe uh, Cole's reflective cycle right. uh, or Jahari window or another. But one of my favorites is, um, is Brookfield. And it's about looking at our lesson through, let's say, different lenses and different pairs of glasses. So we'll reflect on the lesson from our point of view and think, well, how did... How did I, that, that go? Uh, but then he, he encourages you to, well, take off your glasses, your lenses, and put on the glasses of the learners. From the learner's perspective, how was that? And look at that lesson. Look at the, all the things, the ups and downs, the pros and cons, whatever, through the lesson's perspective, from the student's perspective. But look at that perspective from a colleague. If a colleague was observing you, how would they feel, think about that lesson? And then you also look at it from the literature, the academic literature's point of view. And it's like, well, how would, how would the, the academia view this? Yeah. Um, and I, I, I refer to, I do that quite a lot when I think about my sessions because um, it helps me remember that it's not just, that I'm, I'm not the only person in the room, that there are many, many others. And it, it helps me think, that well, if I piece together all of these four, then I'll get many conflicting opinions about how well something went or how good or bad something was. Um, but it starts to give me an understanding of the, the different experiences in the room. That's brilliant. I think I, I've I heard you speaking about this uh, this model. I haven't actually read about it. Uh, I think you were speaking with is it is it Ross Ross Thornburn? Ross from, Thornburn, uh, yeah, probably yeah. in um, his uh, uh, Tefal Institute podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah, he's got loads of lovely stuff on there. Um, but uh, I, I, you were talking about this, and it got me. To, I, I must have watched this a while ago. I think, um, and it got me got me really thinking. Now that you've, you've mentioned it, it's, it's just jogged my memory. Um, and that's that's a really really interesting way to conceptualize, you know, looking at a session or looking at a program from from yourself, from the learners, from the colleagues in the literature. I'll have to give that a try. I have to get. Have to, yeah, have to, yeah, definitely, we'll have to try that. Um, yeah, I suppose reflection is is one of those things. You know, for example, the Joe Luft in the, in the Joe Harry windows is is quite 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 common, if you will. Um, uh, but certainly, Cold 
and uh, and yeah, but Brookfield, I haven't I haven't heard about. I'll definitely have to take a look at that. Um, okay, the last section that we have is is generally for books, but we're going to do it in two things, I suppose. Um, any book recommendations first, we'll, and then we'll go into Trinity Resources perhaps after. Um, what book recommendations do you have for teachers that are perhaps looking to develop as a trainer or build sort of that received knowledge, if you will, um, of, of training or, or, or anything really? Oh, well, well um, this, is the, this is the time where I could say, here's something I prepared earlier. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm gonna very briefly share my screen. Brilliant, if I may. excellent, yeah. Um, so this is the article I referred to earlier. Um, the, so I kind of had an anticipation we'd be talking about this. Um, and it's one of my favorite articles as well. So if you type this into Google Scholar, this is a freely available article. Um, so published in Teacher and Teacher Education. So re really nice um, starting book by Leo Schulman, who talked a lot about pedagogical experience and uh, pedagogy. Something that really ideologies works. Um, I'd also say that a lot of times in ELT, we often just get caught up within the world of ELT. Mm. And, and there's a huge body of literature and some really great books outside of ELT where we can learn an awful lot to develop our practice. So one of them I'm going to say is uh, anything by Hattie, John Hattie, uh, and this one here about uh, mind frames for visible learning. So I think that's that's one of my, one of my favorites. Um, another one, uh, Phil Race in terms of assessment, uh, making teaching work. So Phil Race and Ruth Pickford, really, really good uh, resource. Um, this is, a, I'm sure this one has been referenced. So going back to more standard teaching, uh, task for language teachers, resource book for teaching and training. So CUP, really good uh, Martin Parrott book. Um, probably one of my absolute favorites recommending for English language teachers. And I know, I think other people have referred to this one is of course, Randall and Thornton's advising and supporting teachers, fantastic book. Really, really good and just building an awareness of things outside of language that we need to consider. Um, and if we are looking at language teaching, John Hughes has done some great stuff. And of course, uh, he's also a serious author uh, for the Pavilion ETpedia range. Uh, but this one by uh, Beth Lee and Nicholas North Northall, um, 500 Ideas for Teacher Training, is also a fantastic resource. So they're my, they're my top uh, tips as I, as I looked in my library just before the call to see about <laughs> which ones to recommend. No, they're amazing. I mean, um, I, I've, I've read Advising Supporting Teachers and, and I have tasks for language, uh, for language teachers as well. Um, the ETPD one I have heard very good things about, but I haven't actually ordered about. I've just recently ordered, I'm waiting to come in the post, uh, John Hughes, uh, an introduction, a practical introduction to, to teacher training. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading that. Um, but one thing that, that, that I, I really like what you said is looking outside of EOT. Um, and it's something that a number of people have mentioned, you know, we often get, I mean, I know myself, I, I know I love reading everything about language teaching, I'm reading this and this. Um, but looking outside EOT uh, for those insights, you know, in sort of psychology and all sorts of things. Uh, I'm reading uh, at the moment, it's Psychology for Language Teachers. I think it's an old book. It's about mm, 99 to 1000. It's, for, it's from, from CUP. But it looks at psychology and how that's relevant to, to, to language teaching. And it's like, why haven't I read this stuff before? Right? There's so many insights in there for, for teaching. So, um, yeah, it's not having the reflectors on, right? It's not being blocked out just just for EOT but anyway, I'll put links to all of those um and that article as well I'm gonna have a read of that article it sounds really amazing um I suppose are there any trinity resources available for teachers looking to well teachers looking to develop but also teachers looking to to perhaps develop as trainers yeah um there are so there's I mean probably one of the the, the nicest kind of sets of things you mentioned assessment literacy earlier oh, we've got a series of 10 uh, videos with worksheets to guide these videos available, helping teachers understand what is assessment literacy, uh, why it's important from a teacher's and a learner's perspective. But uh, it, this covers things like the difference between formative and summative assessment, or um, let's say initial and diagnostic assessment, and kind of understanding what those are and how those are different and why it's important to know those differences in helping support our learners. But also one of my favorite one of these videos, these videos are range between 10 and 15 minutes each 
and they've basically divided into let me three or four minute chunks okay. of worksheets to go along with these but um helping understand about constructive alignment for example mm. uh, and how we can align the outcomes of what we do of, of our class what we do in the classroom and maybe our course aims um so that kind of stuff so you can i'll send you the link but uh, mm. basically it's tccollege.com forward slash tsol hyphen al al for assessment literacy that's probably um one of the best bits uh, we also have resources for centers as well um, where we have uh, yeah, a variety of resources so I, um, i'll send you a link for that as well and we've got an interview with john hughes um, as well talking about how to become a teacher trainer so uh, yeah, i'll see if i can't get a jump link for that so uh, your your viewers can get that directly oh that's absolutely amazing thank you very much yeah i mean there's just so much so much that you're giving me so much today ben it's amazing uh that's, that's what you get in a call with me yes <laughs> Well, Ben, I, I won't take up any more of your time. Um, you have, as I said, you've given us so much today. Um, your insights, well, I mean, massive insights. We've looked at a, a range of different things from, you know, obviously the challenges of teacher training, but also the future of, of, of language teacher education, which I, which I found really, really interesting. Um, and I'm sure that teachers around the, the world are going to find lots of insights in, in, in this bunch chat. Um, so thank you very much for being here, for taking the time out of your schedule. And I suppose I look forward to eventually seeing you again at a conference or, or somewhere around the world, perhaps back here in Spain. Um, well, if, if it's my choice, I, I think I'd like to be back in Spain. It's been uh, <laughs> about eight months since I've been there, and I'm, I'm feeling the uh, withdrawal symptoms of not having uh, tapas and red wine. So I hope it's uh, in the Zaragoza or somewhere uh, somewhere hot anyway, hot and sunny. Brilliant. Excellent. Looking forward to it, okay? Thanks very much. Cheers, man. Bye.